Welcome back. This is the 18th show in the series Rehabilitation Coming Soon, where we have been discussing mass incarceration in Hawaii and throughout the United States and addressing other issues that are important in our community with respect to our correctional system. I'm Bob Merce, and I'm going to be the host for today's show and for the shows on the next two weeks to give our usual host, Aaron Wills, a, uh, a little, little bit of a well-deserved vacation. Our guest today is retired circuit court judge Michael Town, and we're going to be talking about restorative justice. Uh, before we begin the conversation, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on Judge Town. He has degrees or holds degrees from Stanford University, from the Hastings College of Law, and he has a Master of Law degree with a special or emphasis in constitutional law from Yale University. Uh, he's a former Peace Corps volunteer in, the, um, in Colombia, South America, for, in the early days of the Peace Corps, 62 to 64, when it was just being formed under President Kennedy. Um, as a lawyer, he has a long and distinguished career in Hawaii. He was an, a, a law clerk for, the, for Associate Justice uh, Bernard Levinson when, um, uh, a number of years back. Um, he was a supervising attorney and litigation director of the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii. Uh, he was a district court judge, then he was a family court judge in the First Circuit for many years where he developed a well-deserved reputation as being a zealous advocate for children. He then became a criminal on the criminal bench in the First Circuit Court and presided over a lot of cases until he retired in 2010. Um, he, he retired in 2010, but he wasn't... Uh, uh, he didn't have much of a retirement because very shortly thereafter, the next year, uh, uh, Governor Abercrombie appointed uh, Judge Town to the Hawaii Paroling Authority to a four-year term. Uh, that term expired and he was reappointed for another term by Governor Ige and is presently one of the five members of the Hawaii Paroling Authority. He also has a very active uh, alternative dispute resolution and mediation practice with uh, DPR or dispute Preve prevention and resolution here in Hawaii and is a very sought after as a, as a mediator. Uh, Judge Town has lectured and written extensively on restorative justice. I've heard him called by some people the father of restorative <laughs> justice in Hawaii. He's trained many of the practitioners. He's talked and, and lectured both nationally and internationally on the subject of restorative justice and we're very, very pleased to have him. So welcome, Judge Town. Thanks, Bob, for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here. Many of our viewers probably know something about or have heard about uh, restorative justice, but aren't really clear as to w what it is and how it works. And I wonder if we could just begin with you giving us kind of an overview of what, what restorative justice is. Hey, without, without being a law professor, just as a kid playing in the backyard, community justice is it's the way that neighborhoods solve their problems. It's the way that families should solve their problem. It's about uh, helping the victim, if there is one, to, to become whole again and how to repair that by an apology, by restitution, by maybe getting some services and also accepting the, the fact that somebody may have made a mistake. And if you take this sort of community justice and you expand it, it's, it's swept around the world many times informally in First Nation communities um, and just across America in our neighborhoods. So it, it, it's uh, basically a way of just getting to yes, building sustainability and helping victims get a buy into the process rather than this adversary system that can butt heads and nobody wins. Okay, if, 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 if I was a victim of a crime and um, I wanted to participate in restorative justice, what would I be looking forward to? What would, what would happen with me? What would happen with the uh, person who harmed me, stole my material or whatever it is that they did? How, how would this work as a practical matter? Well, there's informal and informal types. In a school setting, it might be in, with the teacher or the vice principal or a restorative justice professional. In, we have restorative justice in the uh, misdemeanor courts and the family court. They meet with a probation officer. People don't have to buy into it. The victims may want nothing to do with the perpetrators, the offenders. Others really want to know, why, were, why was I targeted? What's going on here? And what, can I, what, what do I want from my, from my perpetrator to make this whole? Usually it's an acknowledgement, maybe an apology, and if somebody's, let's say, kid rips off their car or rips off the house, or, um, 
how to, uh, how to make that right, making them go out and earn some money, make them whole. So the, 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 the person who committed the offense tries to make up for what they did in some way by re restoring the balance between the, 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 the two of them. Yes. To, to, to a state of equilibrium, kind of. Yes. It, we, it, we have an initiative in the judiciary that Chief Justice Moon put in uh, a while back. It's called Pono Caulique, means restorative justice. It's righteous equity. You know, it's a way to, and it's happening already. And we all know this instinctively. It's not some fancy new program with bells and whistles. And it happens around the world. And what, is, is, it, is it a new idea, an old idea? Uh, what, are the, what are the origins? Where does it, it stem from? It's an old idea. In, in Europe, the victim is actually a party to the situation. And it, it comes out, as I said, first communities. I went to New Zealand, I saw family group circles. Up in Alaska and in Canada, they have, they have uh, sentencing circles. People talk about it. Now, ultimately, the judge has to make a decision. Is this the right thing to do? As a judge, sometimes I didn't always, let's say the victim wanted to forgive the person, wanted him to get off scot-free. I'm not going to accept that usually as a judge. But uh, it at least gives the victim input, and it lets the offender hear the harm, because sometimes they're in denial. So um, how long does the, the process take? Let's say we've, we've scheduled a, a restorative justice session with um, somebody who's committed a misdemeanor, and the, uh, let's say it's a shoplifting, yeah. and somebody from ABC stores is there, and somebody, and, and the young, let's say it's a, a juvenile who's mm -hmm. s stolen some sunglasses. Um, how would, how would uh, that, that work then? Well, the probation officer usually, or the sentencing official, and the judge, but sometimes people don't show up, the victims don't want to show up. They want anything to do with them. Others want to know, why was I targeted? Why'd you pick on my house, my car? Why'd you pick on my kid? Why did you take my kid's cell phone? That kind of thing. Juvenile court's real good. In schools is real good. I, misdemeanors is better sometimes too. And I've seen it in felony courts and I've read nationally, like in Minnesota, they do uh, it in homicide cases. The uh, person's locked up and then they bring in the family and the family, it has to be voluntary. So it, they don't force people and they wanna hear what happened. In, in the circuit court, if you are a crime victim, does somebody talk to you about the option of, of trying to uh, have a restorative justice session with the person who is the, the perpetrator? I don't know if they have them in our circuit court anymore. I, I uh, retired in 2010. I got re-inspired to do mediation and work in the parole board, but we sure like to hear from the victims in the parole board. Okay. Um, and I think that's important. They have a say. And I, I want to look to it to see if the offender really is ashamed of what they did in a constructive way. What are they going to just come up with a bunch of pathetic excuses, or are they going to sort of man up, woman up, if you will? Mm -hmm. um, does does restorative justice have any uh, sort of antecedents in let's in in Native Hawaiian uh, culture or in indigenous cultures uh, throughout the world? Yes, we, we've read a lot about that. Much is written. If you look on, God forbid, Google, you'll read a lot about it. And in New Zealand, we saw that with family group circles. Oh, Pono Pono in, in Hawaii, and then in, in, certainly in Canada and in uh, Alaska, there are these sentencing circles, they're called. And they're, 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 that's serious business. Sometimes, the ones I saw, at least videos of, sometimes there's 10 or 15 people everybody who cares about this let's say this kid that violated the law and they let him know but he also has to take responsibility i think part of the key is accountability so there's three parts really uh, accountability and then competence building competence in the offender and then is the community safe i want to make the point public safety is critical if, if we're not going to put the public at risk uh, just because of this program okay <clears throat> when um what do you hope is the outcome, let's say, for, for each of the, the two parties? Let's say mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, um, a theft case. And what do you hope that will happen psychologically to the, mm -hmm. to the victim? And what do you hope will happen to the person who committed the offense when the whole process is over? You know, I wrote an article that came out in the Advertiser uh, 16 years ago about restorative justice helps the victim become whole again. I don't know. It really de it's fact intensive. It's discretionary. It's, this is a process, if you will. It's not an event. 
and so it's driven by the needs of the parties and they're going to trust it that way if they think we're have some new fancy program they're not going to buy into it so it's very voluntary and and, and it's uh, up front and sometimes in your face um what kind of training does does someone need to go through in order to be a facilitator in one of these uh, restorative justice sessions that's a great question i think if they they uh, now i went to public school and you have some common sense and you played a lot of sports and and you develop a sense of common sense and then you got to be alert got to be empathic empathy for different people's positions and not have this thing of, uh, i'm straight law and order i'm straight forgiveness you have to blend in all these different needs and there are trainings for it and i've i've, I've engaged in those trainings as a judge because we were pretty much uh, this d false dichotomy of punishment versus rehabilitation and that's that's a false dichotomy it's there's this areas of gray if you will in between okay um i i was reading some articles uh be before before today to sort of read up on restorative justice and i read one that i thought was was kind of interesting where a a, a boy took a cell phone that a girl had mm -hmm. abandoned for a few 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 minutes to go somewhere and he sent some really awful text messages to her friends and to her mother and she found out about it and she was you know really really upset and she had a lot of a lot of work to do with the people who received these messages and say, look, it wasn't me. <laughs> um, and the boy really didn't understand what he did. And the, the gist of the article, though, was that when, when uh, one, of the, one of the text messages went out to, to, to her mother and said, I hate you. And so, right. you know, the mother came and she told the boy, you know, look, this maybe it was a joke for you, but, you know, this is how it affected me. And then the friends said, this is how it affected me. And they had everybody who got the text messages, everybody was there. And it appeared that for the first time, the boy understood the real serious consequences of what he did. And that seemed to me to be a lot more important than suspending him from school for three days and not really understanding uh, how you hurt people when you do those things. I agree. Do you want a robust take on, on what really happened and whether that child or that adult understood what they did, the harm they did. Okay. I know in, in our court system today, we have what we, they call therapeutic courts. Uh, yes. We have a mental health court, a drug court, a veterans court. Um, how are those related, if they are, to restorative justice? It's a, it's a parallel collaborative process. Not, I, I always kid people, it's not collaborative. Where we force them in is collaborative. So it, it runs parallel. There's an ethic of care. If I go down to the ER and I've got a sore toenail, I want to be treated properly, patiently, timely, therapeutically. And that's the same ethic of care in the court. Instead, many times people go to the court system and they're, they're marched around like automatons and that doesn't work. And they're often treated in tough ways. And so it's therapeutic justice is wonderful and there's national conferences and books on it now. Okay. Um, we're about time for a break. We'll be back in a few minutes. Um, this is Bob Merce with Judge Town, and this is Rehabilitation coming soon. Hi, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I'd love you to join us every week, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. for E Hanakako. Let's work together. We report every week on the good things going on in our state as well as the better things that can go on in the future. We have guests covering everything from the economy, the government, and society. See you Mondays on Ehanakako at 2 o'clock p.m. Until then, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage, which is on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock here on Think Tech. On Center Stage, I talk with artists about not only what they do and how they do it, but the meat of the conversation for me is why they do it, why we go through this. A lot of us are not making our livings doing this, and a lot of us would do this with our last dying breath if we had that choice. And that's what I love to talk to people about. I hope you enjoy watching it, and I hope you get inspired because there's an artist inside you too. Join us on Center Stage at 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Bye. Welcome back. This is Bob Merce again, and we're here discussing restorative justice with retired Supreme Court, uh, retired Circuit Court Judge Michael Town. Um, when we left off Judge Town, we were just talking about some of the very basic principles. I take it that one of the things that you, we want to happen when we have restorative justice is for the, um, 
the perpetrator of, of the offense to understand the harm that they cause yes. and to get the, the, um, the victim of the offense to have some sort of satisfaction that, that uh, you know, about what's, what's been done to them and, and, and the, the, the other person does understand it. Yes. Um, is it difficult to, you know, I'm thinking if you're the victim of a serious crime or you've been beat up and it's a physical crime, is it, is it difficult for people to face the, uh, the person who did it and, and try and work out a, 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 a sort of a mutual coming together and mutual understanding? I think it takes preparation and if there's a good facilitator that will work and everybody's different. I had one woman who lived by herself. I think she'd lost her husband. She'd been burglarized and she wanted this young young adult to understand how how that broke her heart breached her privacy the stuff he took was awful but she also wanted to be able to forgive him if she could hear that he was con he was contrite and ashamed and so she came into court and she spoke to him and to me and said that happened and she needed this for so quote unquote closure so it's a process again other people want nothing to do with it they'll they'll just say we're done you know we trust the judge to or they'll say hammer him. I've also had other people say, um, we're over this, we know the family, cut him slack. Ultimately it's up to the judge, but people come in in all different ways, Bob, and, and that's what's interesting about it. There's no one size fits none or one size fits all. And I take it not everyone is a success. I mean, you try to get people back on the same page to understand each other yeah. and to restore it, but probably, if, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Huh? Well, they have to reflect and take accountability and be ashamed. I want them to be constructively ashamed. That's very important. But um, usually people get that. But if they don't, then we've got to be worried about public safety. Is this going to happen again and again? So um, it, it varies. I think generally it's constructive. Okay. Um, are there criticisms of restorative justice? Is there a downside to it or... Have, have uh, scholars who have looked into it said, yeah, it's good in these ways, but you know, uh, it, you know it, 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 it's got some problems. Uh, just what, what is the take on that? Oh, absolutely. There's plenty written, and so the, the people that are interested can again Google it and re read the different things. I don't know if there's one on Wikipedia on restorative justice. There probably, <laughs> probably is. Yes, yeah. But I've heard people say, uh, I'm very, very dissatisfied. I didn't get my pound of flesh. I want this to be way more punitive. I've heard people, I had a I had a homicide case where a kid was driving too fast. He ran over a kid by the road, killed a young kid, and the family forgave him. But it, and we, we needed to hear out that guy, and, what, and he clearly put on probation with some additional jail time or maybe prison time. So each one varies. And ultimately, there's a, the judge has to make the final call. And, and that's, that's another training thing. I, I hope that more judges learn about restorative justice. I had a call, gee, last week about restorative justice in the federal courts. And I know Judge Kobayashi understands it, which is what I told the attorney. This attorney never heard of restorative justice. Thought it was a newfangled project. <laughs> no, um, you mentioned the word forgiveness. Is that a key element of the, of the whole restorative justice process? I think so. If people are contrite and they apologize authentically and genuinely, um, then sometimes there's, a, there's forgiveness. Um, but again, the, the, the judge has to make that call. Okay. Um, I know in South Africa they had a long <laughs> process following the, uh, the restoration of, 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 the, of the new government there. And um, it was called the, the Truth and Reconciliation yes, Commission. Um, it, is, it sounded like that's part of the restorative justice process too. Is that, would that be right? Absolutely. That's, that's like exhibit A of how to do it. Bishop Tutu was one of the conveners. He heard the victims and the victims' families, uh, how much they suffered. And then also he heard the perpetrators in apartheid, racist perpetrators that had finally seen the light. They'd heard the They'd heard of the shame that went on. They'd heard what went on. And at some point, Bishop Tutu put his head under the table because the pain was so much. So that raises the question whether we as judges or mediators or restorative justice professionals can bear hearing all this hurt. And is that empathy too much? Are we suffering from compassion fatigue or secondary trauma? And some people don't want to hear that. 
other people, I think they should welcome it. So we need justice professionals that, that embrace that. As I understand, you're, you actually have, have talked all, all across the country to judges about burnout and uh, being you know, overtaxed with the, uh, all of the trauma that you see every day and have to hear every day. Particularly in family court, but domestic violence cases, homicide cases, and we see it in the parole board. Yeah, I bet you. And do. you got to take a long hot shower when you go home, and you got to take a long hot walk mm -hmm. and hug your families and realize that I think this is this is uh, the right work to do. And if it isn't, you you may have to look for something else to do. Yeah, yeah. I, here's, I just had a thought that it seems like sometimes when a criminal gets uh, is convicted and then sentenced, they say community service. Right. But the community service that they perform isn't necessarily in any way related to the offense they committed or to the person who was harmed. And I'm wondering, might it be smarter justice for us to try and, if, if, if the victim is willing, to, to re realign that so that the community service would in some way confer a benefit on the person who was harmed and thereby make the both both parties feel a lot better because you've really tried to restore the, the status quo. Absolutely, it should be tailored and targeted. Those, the double T, T2, and if that's done, then the community service really makes a difference. And it's not, again, just another bureaucratic program that has no sense. Yeah, that, that, that seems... Great point. Um, Has have the Hawaii courts formally recognized restorative justice as a way of uh, of resolving disputes? Yes, I have right in front of me, signed by my colleague Ronald T. Y. Moon, Chief Justice of the State of Hawaii, and uh, the date is October 10, 2000. Resolution concerning restorative justice and the concept of pono kauliki, and he recognized it. It's a resolution, and he wants us to wanted it to continue, and it is. It's it's part and parcel of the Hawaii uh, judiciary. You, you mentioned Pono Kaliki. What, is, what does that mean? Well, my, my law clerk, Kilipaki Vaughn, figured that out together. It, mean, it means uh, righteous equity, literally, but it means restorative justice. Many of these terms, you know, they have 14 different kauna. <laughs> I like Pono Kaliki. So in, in a way that is, it's making the relationship between the two people Pono. Right, and we want, we want sustainability because people, thank God we don't have the death penalty in Hawaii. Yeah. You know, and so people are going to get out and they're going to get out broken or they're going to get out better out of the system. And the community feels that this person has learned. And with this mass incarceration movement is being st stopped and hopefully halted around the country, President Obama, Attorney General Lynch, and I think even in Hawaii we're, we're addressing crazy mass incarceration. That is not the answer. Do, do we know if, um, let's say, somebody is uh, found guilty and they go through a restorative justice um, a session, mm -hmm. um, if, that, if the people go through these who participate in restorative justice, if we have a lower recidivism rate for those people, or have we not collected that data yet? It may be there. I don't know it. But what I will tell you, as chief judge of the family court, when I get divorce cases and these family cases, once they settled voluntarily, and there was entered into an order. Those orders lasted way longer than ones that were judicially imposed. If a judge forces a solution versus the parties agree to one, uh, the forced solution will fall apart faster than the agreed upon one. For obvious reasons, everybody's bought in. If I can yeah, sort of chime in on my own experience as a, as a civil attorney, um, if you go to trial, you have a big battle with the other side. One side wins, the other side loses. Once the jury gives its verdict, the case is over basically, and mm -hmm. you don't see the other side again. And it's not a very good resolution. I mean, money is paid or whatever, but mm -hmm. it's just, it's not. But uh, if I contrast that with the cases I've settled where everybody sits around the table, we reach an agreement and, you know, everybody shakes hands or hugs and yeah. says, you know, this is a good solution. Then I think everybody feels better about how but, the case was resolved. It's party driven, not attorney driven. And in family law, internationally, uh, I think the clergy and the community non-adversarially sorted these out, not in the courts. So we have this adversary system in America, one size fits none or all. And in commercial situations, same thing, a, a committee would handle them, not the attorneys. But in America, we, everything's adversary.
and expensive and time consuming. Okay. Um, I think we're just about running out of time here. Uh, we have to, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, it, it, do you think we're using restorative justice enough here in Hawaii, or do you think that there, there's room to expand its use, and uh, both in the courts, uh, let's say, and, and, at, and in schools, for example, which seem to me to be a, a great setting for it? I don't think we use it enough, but I, I can't prove it, but we need, to, it, it needs to, these, these will grow informally, formally. I know that there are universities that have restorative justice majors, particularly in Europe. And I know that there are prisons that have restorative justice, like in Norway, where you went. We, our first show was about that. Right. Uh, that works. People are dressed in, uh, dressed in a therapeutic way, in a personal, collegial way, um, inmates are, and the staff. So the more we train and treat each other better, the, in the long run, the better com community we're going to have. Granted, there are needs to have some people locked up a while, but those are few and far between. A lot of the people on these shows of, uh, uh, the re 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 have talked about trauma, and it seems like uh, what, what you're talking about here is a way that you can really reduce that trauma or make it less, less traumatic for, for everybody concerned. Yeah, and the, the, the legal system shouldn't increase trauma. That's called, well, they call it in medicine iatrogenic, the harm caused by the care. I call it jurogenic. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, uh, Judge Town, it's been great having you on, on the show. I think we've, we've, we've learned a lot. I wonder if you have any last comments here on, on restorative justice for us before we, before we go. Yeah, but, but, but I wrote my article. Talk about it at your dinner table. See if it makes sense. Truth test it. See if it's authentic and transparent and uh, see if it works in, in your church, your school, your, your workplace. Sort things out informally. Sounds, sounds like a great idea. Thank you for being with us and taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here today. Thank you. Um, so that end, ends the show for today, and um, we hope you'll join us next week. And coming up uh, next on Think Tech Hawaii is Sustainable Hawaii with Kristen Turner. Thank you all for tuning in today. Hi, my name is Aaron Wills. You are watching thinktechhawaii.com. I am the host of the show Rehabilitation Coming Soon. You can catch us live on thinktechhawaii.com at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. I will see you there.